We're back with Dawn DeLuise, who told us part one of her story last week. Right. She thought she was being stalked by a rival beautician, but then she was the one that actually ended up getting arrested. This story is about to take a major turn, and our listeners aren't even going to believe what happens next. So true. They were allowed at the very last minute to enter um, a very vague charge that the judge said she would determine later on what the penalty was if I was found guilty of it, and it was that I was about to plan some bodily harm to someone. On March 5th at 7.30 in the morning, I'm awoken by a SWAT, a SWAT team banging on my bedroom door. And I go downstairs and Macaulay's leading the pack with the guns drawn and the vests on and all this. And I just froze. I literally felt freezing cold. I didn't know what was going on. And he said, do you know why I'm here? And I said, no. And he said, Chris Guiley. Well, to back up a little bit, I didn't even understand what he was talking about. I knew Chris Guiley about as well as I know the, the two of you. I had met him at a restaurant up in Big Bear on one occasion several months back, and he had been an ex-Detroit Lion, so people were coming up and getting pictures taken with him, which I did as well, and that was the end of that. We introduced ourselves to each other. I learned that he had a barbecue sauce that he sold, and I wanted to buy some, so I connected with him on Facebook and ended up buying it. So we were now Facebook friends, even though that meant nothing, except I went back up there again around Christmas with my youngest daughter, and oh, there's that guy, you want a picture with a, a, a football player? So we got a picture, and then that was that. But I began to use him as an example when I would talk to Edward Feinstein, I know a man who will take Gabriel out, because he was six foot ten, you know, he looks really imposing, and I said, that's, yeah, I'm going to tell him, come down here and, you know, kill the guy. Uh, no plan, no plot, just, and then within the thread of this text, I said, at the very least, it's going to scare Suarez when he sees this man. And Feinstein's texting back, going, oh, that would be great. Why don't you invite him out to have lunch? And the very least you can do is sit in the courtyard, and um, Gabriel Suarez will see you, and he may think, oh, I'm going to leave this woman alone. So I actually um, had, I, I finally picked up the phone and called Chris Guiley. And I was crying, and I said, um, I'm very, very scared, and you don't know that this is going on, but I have been using your name and I felt it only fair to let you know. And he said, look, I don't know you very well, but tell me what's been going on. And I told him everything. And he said, I I'm going to come down in a couple of weeks and we'll go to lunch. I just want you to point out this person that you're talking about. So that was all the backside story to where McCulley is now on my landing at 730 on March 5th saying Chris Guiley's the reason we're here. So this is something I don't understand. All I know is um, I'm being put in handcuffs. Uh, I get out in front of my street. There's all these police SUVs and whatnot, and a whole caravan takes me to the West Hollywood Sheriff's Department, and I'm booked there on a million dollars bail with solicitation to commit murder, and Steve McCulley says to me, he says, there's one thing you need to know, Don. You've been traveling with some real sordid characters lately. I don't know what you got yourself into, but I'm telling you right now, you have one friend, and that's Edward Feinstein, because he kept you from doing something that would have put you in prison for life. I still don't know what in the world he's talking about. How does Feinstein factor in? How do you think the police figured this I out? I had no idea. I thought that somehow or another that Edward Feinstein had probably told them that I had legitimate concerns. And then there's some way that I didn't even think it through. I, he just told me, you were stopped from doing some real harm to someone. And um, we're here because of Chris Guiley. But I didn't think, no, actually, I didn't think that Guiley had said anything to them. I think I was just so overwhelmed. I didn't have any idea what was going on. Even when they told me what the charge was, I thought that was preposterous. And I didn't know. And, and then I'm being arraigned, and it's this circus, and I didn't I remember being on the bus pulling up to the courthouse and looking outside and I said I hope that's not for me there were like 30 thing and I remember just the feeling of I wanted to be invisible because as a girl there's I'm not wearing any makeup and you know I, I, and I'm just very very upset and this is not the success that I've had up till this point which was very legitimate and credible so I'm in jail what did they say you were charged with solicitation to commit murder and that the bail was a million dollars and I had a public defender, and the argument was, this is overkill, this is overcharge, uh, she did nothing wrong, um, we like to let her just go home, she, this is a first offense, And but the prosecution argued that this alleged victim wasn't safe, and that there was an actual plot to kill him, and off to jail I go. And so far, all I'm thinking is, well, gosh, my 
texts said all that, but I knew inside that nothing was going on, so I didn't know how this had come about. I still did not know until later that same week. I got arrested on Wednesday, and boy, were they quick. It was either two days later or the following Friday that 2020's got this thing up, right, already talking to Feinstein, the main person. And I could barely see the TV from my jail cell, but I could sure hear it. And I could catch the reflection on the window and I could see um, from the TV screen that Feinstein was being interviewed and that he had stopped me from doing all these horrible things and that, yes, I was buying a gun and all that. And that's when I went, oh my God. Now, I was in solitary confinement, so I had limited um, use of the phone. And when I was calling... I remember my landlord had said to me, not my my business landlord, my home resident landlord in North Hollywood had said, yeah, Officer McCauley stopped by here the same day you were arrested. He came by at around 11 o'clock in the morning. Now, bear in mind, I was arrested at 7.30, so I guess he hightailed it back to begin his investigation, which he didn't do prior to arresting me. And he had already gone to my business partner. So by the time it's 11 o'clock and he makes his way to my landlord, he says to her, I think I made a big mistake. I don't like what I'm hearing when I'm talking to people. I don't like what I'm hearing. Uh, can you tell me about her character? So now he's on a character search, and she told him I was one of her favorite. Because I used to go to coffee with her, and, you know, her and I were really close, my landlady. And uh, he goes, yeah, that's what I'm hearing from everybody, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And so he starts to blab to almost anyone that would listen. He had made a mistake. He goes to the prosecution's office. In hindsight, I learned that they went to Jackie Lacey's office and said, uh, we don't have a case. What are we going to do? And the response was, the media is already involved. We don't open the doors and let her just go home. However, start talking plea deals. She doesn't have to be here any longer than necessary if she's willing to comply. Uh, and I didn't know all that was going on. But I knew I wasn't going to sign any plea deals I was because I had done nothing wrong. So I ended up staying there and that is when I had to watch my life unfold. I was getting, the type of mail I was getting was eviction notices, was I had, I got called downstairs into the lobby of the jail at one point when I was being handed a restraining order that Gabriel Suarez had put out against me. Eviction notices, I mean it was like the worst things that could happen to a person. Um, I was, I weighed about what I weigh now when I was arrested. I lost 20 pounds when I was in there. Just the stress it was just awful. Uh, I was in high profile, which is the worst of the worst. You're only in there if there's a dead body in your wake or if you um, are severe child molestation cases. I was in cell, pod number one, tier two, shelt, cell 28. That happens to be the pod that Paris Hilton spent a brief time in years ago when she was in the mail, in the news for whatever reason. But uh, the irony is that we were both ultimately, you know, involved with Nick Prugo against our will. So, um, do you, so do you think that was why they put you in the high profile cell and why the media was involved? Just the second I'm thinking probably because when I walked into that pod, there was cheering and they were throwing the rolls of toilet paper over the edge and everything and clapping. And I thought, I'm not in here for anything that's good. My life is destroyed. They had already been hearing on the news that this celebrity facialist was heading to jail and they were just wondering who, who where she was going to be put. Uh, cause my time spent there was just absolutely surreal. Getting to the phone was the number one thing to try to work my case, to figure out what was going on. Within two days after my arrest, they picked up Feinstein and Prugo and arrested them and took their laptop and, and um, phones. And I still didn't know why. I did not know until I saw 2020, a few days later, that Edward Feinstein was the whole reason this thing had fallen so apart. all you knew, so you had just been arrested, you're in jail, you know you didn't do it, because um, obviously he's still alive and you're just joking around with the text. And you don't know who told Steve McCauley that you were going to kill Suarez. Suarez puts a restraining order out on you. Mm -hmm. um, now you've been in jail a couple days and you see a 2020 episode. And what went through your mind when you saw that and what was on that episode? I just went blank. I couldn't believe Could Even now, I'm taking myself back to that moment. I I couldn't even talk. I, I, I didn't know what to think. I did not know what to think. I live for a great glass of wine at the end of the day. Perhaps while you're listening to your favorite true crime podcast? It's my favorite way to relax. I recently ordered a mixed pack of usual wines so I could give each one a try. And not only is the taste fantastic, but the wines are low carb and have zero grams of sugar. But don't grapes contain sugar? 
To clarify, all usual wines are produced using natural, sustainable grapes harvested every fall. The grapes are picked at optimal ripeness to ensure all sugar will be fermented completely until the wines are dry with no residual sugar. All that's left over is delicious, clean wine. And usual is something for everyone. A red blend, a rosé, and a sparkling white wine called Brut. They also have a limited production Brut Rosé just for the summer. Usual wines are perfect because each bottle is 6.3 ounces a heavy pour, or about a glass and a half of wine, so no more wasting the leftover bottle. There's also a special holiday product coming early November, the Usual Reserve. It's an ultra-premium limited edition Mount Veeder Cabernet Sauvignon. Introducing Usual Reserve, this is their most special wine yet, just in time for the holidays. Hailing from one of the most celebrated plots of land in all of Napa, this Cabernet Sauvignon is concentrated and rich with just enough grip. You can gift it to someone special or keep it all for yourself. The holidays, as usual. Go to their website at www.usualwines.com and use our discount code STALKING for $8 off your first order. And try your first glass on us. That's U-S-U-A-L-W-I-N-E-S dot com with discount code STALKING for $8 off your first order and try your first glass on us. What I put in and on my body is really important to me. So we want to tell you about our favorite natural deodorant, each and every. There are so many things about each and every that are awesome, especially that it was founded by women and designed for all genders to use. Also, it's vegan, cruelty-free, and sustainably sourced, even down to their new eco-friendly plant-based packaging. And the scents are amazing. The coconut and lime reminds me of relaxing on tropical beaches, which is one of my favorite things to do. We all know you love going to the beach. Each and every is made with just six simple ingredients, including coconut oil and dead sea salt, plus essential oils for fragrance. We know you'll love each and every and will want to share it with everyone you know, just like we're doing. Make sure to check out their limited edition gift sets and bundles now and take advantage of this great offer for our listeners. We're going to give you 30% off your first purchase. Go now to eachandevery.com slash stocking and use promo code stocking. Remember to get 30% off, use promo code stocking at eachandevery.com slash stocking. And we'd like to thank our newest Patreon members. Thank you so much for joining us on Patreon. Amber, Danielle, Jane P. Ellen M. Cherry A. Addie N. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon. Because Edward Feinstein's sitting there lying, no, you you know, and then I'm thinking, but all those texts where you told me to do thus and so, and I told you, but I'm just kidding, and you said, you text me back and go, aren't you scared yet? And, you know, I mean, all these things, and and, and how is it that this is happening? It took a period of time, and my public defender wouldn't tell me anything. He was very, very off-putting, uh, off-putting, you know, the whole thing was just really bad. The 2020 episode, what was Edward Feinstein talking about? He was sitting in his apartment saying that he was trying to protect me from myself, that I told him to do all these things, and that he was just following my uh, lead, that I asked him um, to slash my tires, or that I used his laptop to stalk myself. The arrest warrant did state, I later on learned, and this is where we're getting into like almost science fiction territory, that I was doing all these things to myself, denigrating my children on social media, slashing my own tires, sending Craigslist men to my home. And by the way, I was going over to Edward Feinstein's house at night and using his laptop. Henceforth, my footprints or tracks or whatever it might be. So Feinstein had been arrested then by the time he was on the 2020 episode? No, he got arrested uh, um, shortly thereafter. He had. He wasn't arrested. He was arrested about two weeks after I was arrested. 2020 came out about eight days after I was arrested. But on the 2020 episode, he was saying that he was the one doing it because you told him to? He was saying that, I, no, not the tire slashings, that I came over and asked for his help to stalk myself by sending Craigslist men to my door and whatnot. So, Don, when he was first on the show, did he claim to be your accomplice? Yes. No, no, uh, just real good confidant who was who who said that I asked him to do these things as far as making the flyers and but throwing he, them But he around. didn't go through with them. No, he supposedly did, but those weren't crimes at that point. That was just something I was telling him to do. Go make these flyers for me. Got it. Bring these Craigslist men to my door. Um, you know, he was doing the nonsense that even the police told me at the time wasn't a real crime unless I, I could find Suarez doing it to me. So that was sort of like what he he confessed to. And that's where I said, oh, my God, he was doing everything. He was doing absolutely. He's too told. Who knows what he told? Stupid Macaulay by now who didn't even want the case to begin with. You realized in jail that Feinstein was doing everything to you. It wasn't Suarez. 
It was that moment where uh, the, when I went back to my cell, it just started to snowball, and, th and I started thinking, and I bet you Nick Prugo was up to his eyeballs the whole time, too. And that was later confirmed when I heard that they took Prugo and Feinstein's laptops and phones. Then I went, I thought he broke away from Prugo when I did, but that's not what happened. They were both being diabolical, um, you know, uh, behind the scenes, if you will, and causing me trouble. So... I'm now left in jail, and only once a month do you get taken into a hearing, and it lasts about five minutes. <clears throat> Sometimes there's postponements, and you go back three three weeks later. So that was just a process that just lagged on and on and on. Um, plea deals. My public defender was very, very opposed to me at a certain point um, because he started working against me and that he sat down and actually broke bread with Suarez and learned he was a really great guy, you know, and why were you trying to kill him? Well, I wasn't. So I realized I had to get rid of him pretty quick. And um, I had a client who had a private attorney step up, Jermon Hicks, thank God for him. Jermon Hicks used to be um, with the Johnny Cochran Law Firm. And when Cochran died, Hicks went out into private practice with Carl Douglas, who was part of the original dream team that uh, the O.J. Simpson case was a part of. And I remember thinking in the back of my mind, I need somebody to look at Steve McCulley. You know, I don't I don't know what's going on here. He didn't vet his sources before he arrested me. He fessed up to all these people. He'd made a mistake. He went to Jackie Lacey's office and tried to get me out of jail. If all that is true, why am I still sitting here? And the very, very second that Hicks stepped up and took the case, everything kind of went quiet in the DA's office. There was no more offering me plea deals. At one point, the public defender had said, they don't really want to hold you here. You can go home tomorrow. They're not interested in keeping you here. You just have to sign off on a felony. And it can be any felony you want. Sit in your cell with the penal code book and find what you will accept. And I'm thinking, burglary, arson, are you out of your freaking mind? How about if I sit here, because as long as I'm here, I'm innocent until proven guilty, and I'm, I'll just sit here till I rot. I know I didn't do anything. So here comes Hick, and he says, basically, there's not going to be any plea deals. I want to go to trial on this. They don't have anything against you. And so things started to move rather quickly from that point on. He came on board in June. At the time, we had our prelim hearing. About a week later, he was able to catch up with it. And the prelim hearing lasted all day and had one witness on the stand, and that was Steve McCulley. And he, by the time he finished with him, McCulley was getting off the stage with his pants around his ankles. I mean, it just, the incompetence, the did you vet this person? What did you find when you looked on your la their laptop? He just was so befuddled. And uh, I felt really like, well, there's not even going to be a trial there's, if this is what it's based on. But nonetheless, you know, they wanted to proceed with it. So I had to just wait. Plea deals are accepted 95% of the time. I read a lot of law books when I was in there, and I found that out because if you do opt to go to trial, sometimes they will tack on other charges, and it's very, very much to your detriment if you're wasting the time and money of the court going to trial when there's nothing really against you. So um, then end up the 5% that go to trial, 50% are acquitted, 50% go off to prison. So my chances were slim to none if I looked at just the statistics, but I knew that there was no evidence against me. So here we are, now we're heading towards trial. Meanwhile, what I'm hearing on the phone when I'm calling people and when I'm getting visits it's, is that it's it's pretty bad out there for Feinstein and Brugo because um, they're learning even more about them when they took away the laptops and the phones. What did you end up learning about him? Well, I learned on the eve of Thanksgiving, right before Thanksgiving, I was taken to a, by a guard to a little clandestine meeting in the basement of the jail. I had no idea what it was for. And I walked into a tiny, tiny room, and seated was a court reporter, a woman whom I didn't recognize, Officer Steve McCulley, his boss, Steve Rohrbach, my attorney, Jermon Hicks, and myself were crammed into a tiny room. I ended up learning that the woman who hadn't been identified yet was a prosecutor, not on, not in relating to my case, but she handles stockings. And in front of her was a binder that was about this thick. It had a green cover on it. And I'm thinking with my hand spread it was about seven inches thick and it is facing her. And I see she has little yellow post-its all along the lines of the binder. And she says to me, as soon as I sit down, we need your help. We have enough information in this book to put Feinstein and Prugo away in prison for a very, very long time. But we need the truth out of you so you can just stop playing games. Now, we're very much aware of where this was going and how you were working in collusion with Feinstein and Prugo to stalk yourself and out comes this nonsense that I'm just totally in disagreement with and that your alleged victim had less than 48 hours to live. 
And I'm looking at my attorney who hasn't even told me that this meeting was going to be called and he's just got a poker face. And so I said, hell no, no. I started to cry. I said, I didn't do any of that stuff. Why? Am and I turned to my attorney. Why'd you even bring me in here? They don't say anything. They all get up as if there was some unspoken cue and they leave the room except for my attorney. And he says, yeah, I let them have that meeting with you because they got nothing on you and they are desperate and they're grasping at straws. They were hoping you would say whatever you needed to say to get out of jail. They were going to let you just go home, but they would have been able to then let you go home. Yeah, you're guilty and you're going to look like, you know, you're going to really look bad in the court of public opinion, but uh, they can then go after them for everything they have because when they took their laptop and phone, they found that there were numerous other people currently being stalked and terrorized by those men. And, um, and he said, and I want you to know, that even before this meeting, I told them, when she's acquitted, don't you turn around and come back to her with that book. You're not getting my client's help on anything. You should have arrested the right people from the get-go. Well, um, we go to court uh, on January 5th, and when I was downstairs in my holding cell before they took me into the courtroom, you're supposed to be offered your final plea deal. My attorneys come to me and they said one thing, because by this point, Jamon has an assistant, uh, another attorney named Jason Sias, and they come to me and they say, please, 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 can we try the case? We cannot go to trial unless we ask you one final time. Are you interested in any kind of plea deals or will you go to trial? We're begging you. We can win. And I said, of course, let's go to trial. So when we're brought into the courtroom, though, the judge seems a little concerned and she asks me point blank if I was told what the final plea deal was. And... Um, I said, I looked at my attorney and she says, why are you looking at him? Did he tell you what the final plea deal was? And I said, yes, he did, Your Honor. Well, then why are you still in my courtroom? And I said, because I'm, I'm innocent. And she said, well, you know that the plea deal was we were going to let you go home right now. We we're going to drop all charges to a misdemeanor and we were just, just needed you to take anger management courses. Now, you're aware of that, right? And I said, yes, I still want a trial. She was furious. Oh, my goodness. Then she turns her, her anger over to the prosecution. You just were not strong enough. I don't know what in the world. I don't even have this on my calendar for today. I thought you'd said you didn't have any, any evidence against her. Now we have to pick a jury, and we don't even know what we're going to be telling them. That's how my trial unfolded. 17 days of I could relive that time and time again. It was the greatest type of bizarre parallel universe slash reality show that a person could ever be find themselves submerged in where they were getting names wrong and times wrong and my attorney who's defending me had to stand up and sort of help the prosecution out at one time no i know you look confused but that's because she sent a text uh yes it does say eddie i need you to buy bleach and i need you to buy towels and i need you to buy gloves but they weren't up to anything nefarious because um, uh, they're telling you that this was sent to edward feinstein it was sent to her housekeeper who happens to be named eddie gonzalez and the whole trial was like that, where he's standing there and he's trying to help them and the jurists just look so put off. And um, then he gets McCulley on the stand. And I couldn't wait for that day because he just, he takes him down this path of how you've been on the force 18 years, you must be very good at your job, then why didn't you vet him first? Why didn't you this? Why didn't you that? And he just kept, he wouldn't answer. Whatever you do, you take the fifth or whatever you might do. And um, what happened at one point though, where my attorney starts to turn the conversation about, don't you think Miss Deloise was fearful? Don't you have children? You know, I mean, he was very, she was afraid for her two children. And he says, McCulley, uh, there on the stand, he turns to the judge. He goes, you don't understand, officer. I have something I have to say. I have four daughters. And she goes, don't say another word. I want you to stop and think about what you're going to say next. And I want you to remember that you are sitting up there for the prosecution, Mr. McCulley. Shut your mouth right now. Right in front of the jury. I didn't know what he was about to say. But he was about to let something out that might have just changed the course of the entire trial. So then he leaves the stand. The other noteworthy moment was when Gabriel Suarez was up there and swore he had never met me a day in his life until he moved in next to me in July of 2013 did not know who she was did not and of course my attorney let him go with that really we did had you read about her did you have any idea no well, well why did you end up moving in that place well i just happened to be looking for an available um salon and that one was was available and i knew there was an esthetician in there but i figured well it's a really busy location to work out of he goes oh really well here let me put something in front of you if you will would you please read what you said to detective steve mccully in the interview starting with line 13 and it was him saying, yes, I knew her. Um, I came looking for a job back in 2009. Now, he didn't reflect back on early 2000. He denied that in the trial, but I hadn't been able to be my own advocate. Otherwise, I would have been able to have steered them to some Yelp 
photos from back when he worked at that salon in 2000 across the street from me. Uh, so what he said when he was confronted was that with that on the spot, he goes, oh yeah, just this morning when I was driving here today with my parents, you know, my mom and I are very close. We're very close. We love each other. He just goes off on this tangent about him and his mother. And she reminded me when we were in the car coming here that I'd asked for a job. So I'm thinking, well, that makes you look even more than a fool because if she just reminded you and you forget by the time you're on the stand, it'd be one thing if she told you a year ago, yes, I remember. Anyway, so this thing ends. And um, they threw in another charge at the last minute because they weren't gaining much traction with this murder for hire thing. And they had Guiley up there who said none of this ever happened. So they were allowed at the very last minute to enter um, a very vague charge that the judge said she would determine later on what the penalty was if I was found guilty of it. And it was that I was about to plan some bodily harm to someone. Nobody's being identified, just that I had some nefarious intent. And the jury was dismissed at 3.30 on a Friday, no, Thursday. And I was taken back to the jail. And here's the part that we hate because we then have to begin the weight game at the courthouse with the arm chains and the um, waist chains and the ankle chains while we're sitting in a cold little room with just this chair. And that's where you stay for the eight hours. And I was dreading that more than anything. Nothing to read. You can't even eat. And um, I got there the next morning to begin my long wait. And at 9.30, the courthouse began. They allow the jurists to begin deliberating at 9. So at 9.30, they come to get me, and I didn't know why. I had no idea. And I said, why am I going upstairs? And we're taking you into the courtroom. But why are you taking me into the courtroom? I'm supposed to when the jury's reached a decision, and I didn't even know what to think. I didn't even know what to think. I was scared. And my attorney couldn't even get back to the courthouse that quickly. He was having bre breakfast in Century City, and we had to wait for everybody to show up. So I'm in the holding cell just outside of the courtroom while they try and scurry around and get the necessary people in who didn't expect it that quickly. I don't can't tell you how I feel. I didn't think that they were going to say not guilty, but I just knew that I felt sorry for the jury who had to kind of wade through this quagmire. And so they come in, and my two um, attorneys are very nervous and upset. And Jamon says to me, in my career, I've never had a verdict come back this quickly, which isn't guilty. And I put my arm around him, and I'm the one consoling him. And I said, you just have to know something. You laid it all open here. There's no stone, stone unturned. If they find me guilty for any reason, then I must have done something I don't know I did wrong because you were the best counsel I could have possibly had. Please don't be upset. The whole thing lasted about five minutes in the courtroom. She said, um, she didn't even make me stand up. She says, okay, on the first charge of trying to cause bodily harm to someone for some reason, we find you not guilty. And I was like, oh, well, okay. And then on the charge of solicitation to commit murder, we find the defendant not guilty. I was taken and finally released, and I can explain that a little bit more. But apparently, Officer Steve McCulley and his boss raced down the hall after the jurists. And said, not so quick. I'm going to pull each and every one of you. Some of you must have known Miss Deloise or known about this case before it even started because you did not read 1,600 pages of evidence that I gave you in the short time it took you to reach this decision. And this one, the forewoman, put her hands on her hips and says, is it, is it possible that you just didn't have a case? We didn't think she did anything wrong. And you know you're not questioning us. I have a job to get back to. So anyway, that's what happened right afterwards. So um, I get released and I end up going home. Well, home doesn't exist anymore. I'd lost everything. I lost my townhouse. I lost my car. I lost my business, obviously. Um, uh, one friend had stepped up and put a lot of my belongings in storage, thank God. But that was all I had. I even found I had lost what little money I had in the, uh, my bank account. It had been raided while I was out. Now, by that point, I already knew it was fine starting to improve. And when I got the bank statements, it was all these things I had not purchased, food at 7-Eleven and whatnot. So I'm like, oh, great. What am I left with? Well, I have a health problem. I'm left with that. I better get over to USC and find out what's going on. I spent all those months in jail, I had began to complain about my health. I was having some real severe health symptoms problems and I was not being taken to the doctor specifically for what those were. I would be taken for a flu shot or, you know, something small like that. And I didn't know what was going on with my health. So I went to, uh, within days, I was on Medi-Cal, and I found out I had stage 2 colorectal cancer that was never treated while I was in jail. So now the clock is ticking because I was in jail for almost 11 months, and there's a statute of limitations on when you can sue the county and when you can sue the cops. I'm learning all about this, and I don't even have an attorney yet. i got to find the attorney who then has to go through all of this. So I um, landed up back on the doorstep of my 
very, very bitter and angry ex-husband's doorstep. He was not thrilled that that's where I was going to be staying for a while, but my daughters championed for me to do so, and I had nowhere else to go. And that, from that moment onward, for about the next two years, was a point much lower than anything that had happened to then. Till then, it was worse than the stockings. It was worse than the jails because the stockings resumed right away. As soon as I was back in uh, my ex-husband's home, now Craigslist men are being directed to him. And he actually was out back one day sunbathing by the swimming pool when a man walked right in the front door. And my ex-husband goes in to get a drink of water and he sees him in the kitchen and he lunges for him, gets him around the neck drags the guy out into the street. The guy was responding to uh, a sugar daddy ad and I'll be in the bedroom with a blindfold. I mean, some of these things were just ridiculous. And um, we throw the kid out. We call the police. We had been calling them already. We explain what has just taken place and my ex-husband gets admonished. Well, just so that you know, if you had your hands on him, he could have pressed charges. (laughs) So they were more willing to be an advocate for this young guy that walks in and gets thrown out of the house. And so, you know, I just, and my ex would come to me, when are you leaving? When are you leaving? Get out, get out, get out. I've just been given the cancer diagnosis. I have nowhere to go because even my car was gone. Um, And I had just paid it off a week before. It was a new Lexus. I just paid it off a week before um, my arrest. But my ex-husband signed it over to one of my daughters when she joined the Air Force during the time um, I was in jail. And she took it to Arizona and her ex her then boyfriend wrecked it. It was totaled. So I didn't even have a car. But I should go back and say that the stalking that took place during the time I was in jail was aimed at my daughter, the younger one, who joined the Air Force. And I I think she was the primary catalyst to a lot of the stalking that started because it was the, her downfall began when we went to pick up Nick Prugo that day on Memorial Day and he was not home because he had wanted to hang out with her that day and she could have been with friends. And I was angry at him on her behalf and he sent flowers to her and that was not enough. I said, you're never coming to me anymore. So she was pursued relentlessly during the whole time that I was in jail. They avoided telling me a lot of that because I couldn't do anything about it and would be worried, but he even managed to infiltrate the national website that recruits for the U.S. Air Force. He was putting up my website, I mean my uh, mugshot, on their official recruiting page. How he hacked into that, I don't know. Uh, We hire um, people, or we, we want people to serve our country whose parents are criminals. And so she got called in by the colonel one day. She was at Luke Air Force Base. And I was very proud of her, bless her heart, because she became a munitions specialist. She was building building and testing bombs by the time she was 20. And I would talk to her on the phone sometime, and she never told me all this was going on. She wanted to spare me from it. But when I got out, I didn't realize the onslaught of how she was really, the Air Force even um, came together and said, we're going to monitor your mail. You know, we're going to keep an eye on everything that comes in and out of the facility. And I didn't realize that, you know, it was as bad as it was. So then I get out of jail and it resumes and it's happening towards me. I'm stuck. I have to call Steve McCulley. There's nowhere else I can go with this. I tried to call the North Hollywood Police Department, and the lead detective there, Richard Wheeler, said, we want nothing to do with this case. It was in the news. You have to talk to Steve McCauley. The rest of your life, he's the only person that's going to handle this because he was af- affiliated with it. So I have to I have to send an email to this man now, who I just told him I'm going to sue for everything you have. I said, um, you're supposed to be helping me. He says, don't bother me anymore. I don't want anything to do with this. So now I'm basically being told by authorities, you know, good luck. And when I was confronted with the book that had all the crimes that Feinstein and Prugo had done, by now I had a pretty clear picture of what was going were on. Were they looking into him to press charges on him for any of this? Well, that's what know? I think that big book was about. And here's what I learned. Had I done the right thing, according to the judge, I would be out in, out in society nowadays, albeit tainted, having admitted that I was part of some sort of a heinous crime that I didn't do, but they would have been in prison for life. So the lesser of the two evils would be, let me go about and have a tarnished reputation and just fall, let the chips fall where they are in your life. We can now use your word against them. That's what the trade-off would have been. And I said no. So there was a point where I really felt like I did not help those multiple victims that were in that book. That's what I, I felt I didn't do the right thing by throwing myself under the bus. I mean, how this all points to the judicial system and just how extremely flawed it is and whatnot. So now um, there's these, you know, that book is out there and it still probably exists. And ultimately, the woman who was prosecuting that case did become a judge. So Wendy Sagal is now a judge. But um, those 
those I did connect with some other victims of his at one point when I got out of jail. The one in particular had preceded me, and that was what had stuck Edward Feinstein actually in prison for two years because he was not a mild man accountant as I thought. He had actually just gotten out of jail when he started seeing me, and he had met Prugo in jail. So um, he, he had been in there for stalking a, a pet groomer. She had a mobile mobile business, and he, she had hired him to keep the books. He locked her out of the books. He began to embezzle money from her, and he also began to offend and alienate her customers by sending them these very disgusting emails about, you know, well, you're a, you're a cheap Jew. We don't like your dog mutton. You know, he's he's got fleas, and stop bringing him to us. Because he was privy to all this information, so he pretty much destroyed her business. And uh, she was able to get him arrested and charged and convicted. So he was sent away for, I think, nine months. When he was released on that charge, uh, the very day he was released, he went to her home, and he was skulking around, and she saw him taking pictures of her four-year-old son that he then posted on pedophile websites. So he went back to jail right away, immediately in violation of his parole. Uh, so we're talking about a certain type of mentality that most of us don't run into every day. Um, so I'm, I, I, I'm out there. I, uh, the thing that worked really to my advantage was I found an attorney whose name was Dorinda Myers. She was out in Redlands, and she was the only attorney who wanted to touch this case. Everyone else felt like it was just too much to handle, and the statute of limitations was about to expire, and they didn't know what they could do with it. And she says, well, for starters, we're going to get you restraining orders against Feinstein and Prugo. And I said, well, for, according to the sheriff's department and according to the court, you know, uh, well, they were doing this and I was in collusion supposedly. And I don't know how we're going to prove a restraining order. It's not as easy to get as they once were. And she says, we're going to we are going to subpoena Steve McCulley because he knows you were being stalked. And we've all she says, this, this is going to be interesting, though, because she had already filed lawsuit papers against the sheriff's department. So there was a gag order on him from talking about the case, but we're going to pull him into a courtroom and get a restraining order based on his word. So we're kind of setting up a, a lose-lose situation from him. And that's exactly how it unfolded. He failed to show up to the first restraining order hearing. So he was issued, a, you know, you have to come in six weeks from now. He didn't come up. He didn't come in then. By the third time, the issuance was a bench warrant that she put out saying, um, you know, we need to get him in here so we can find out what this is all about. That was supposed to have been on a Friday. The hearing was going to be on a Friday at 10 o'clock the night before he arrested them again. Now, he had arrested them two times prior. He figured he would get them in jail while he'd work on the case. But they, he didn't count on them bailing out so quickly. So this third time when he arrests them, it's half a million dollars bail each. And they were still out within a matter of hours. Um, but he did arrest them, and now he had to formally charge them. So he had, whether he liked it or not, a case he had to put together. So that gave me and my children an automatic restraining order that was good for 10 years when um, since he's now arrested and charged. So we won that that battle, forcing this police officer to do the right thing. So now he's got to build a case and bring those two to trial, which ultimately happened. Um, many, many postponements took place. It was almost a year and a half from that point onward. I think it was the fall of 2017, maybe 18 even, when um, they ultimately had their day in court. It was just a hearing, and the media was there. It lasted two days. Feinstein was being represented by Tamar Armanac. She was an attorney who has been worked with him before. And Prugo was there with Pat Harris, and Pat Harris was Scott Peterson's attorney. So he lacked credibility with me the minute he stood up in the courtroom. And he kept me on the stand for a whole day trying to do character assassination on me and prove that I was forgetful or were you were were you not working with them and in, in, to stalk yourself. So what happened is the judge said, look, I'm tired, sick and tired of this nonsense. I already know. I made my mind up what I'm going to do with you two. If you boys will admit right away that you were stalking her, I'll sentence you tomorrow. And I know what I'm going to sentence you for. And so they jumped up out of their chair. The only person who didn't know what was going on was with me. Why are they so excited to hear what the penalty is for their stalking if everything isn't going on without my knowledge? So we came back to court the next day, and um, the judge pretty much – didn't even throw the book at them, 350 hours of community service each, 20-year protective orders, uh, and um, a, a couple other lame things. Oh, they were not to fraternize with each other for 10 or 15 years. But he did say, I'm going to read off the specifics of this protective order because it's very, very clear. You understand you may not follow it, violate it in the following ways. And it was 
everything from following us to making robocalls to lewd flyers to uh, denigrating on social media to going anywhere near the internet and posting ads to it just went he talked for 10 minutes and he said now um, I'm going to go ahead and issue and I have the right to do this there's a special circumstance attached to this case where I'm going to go ahead and issue the same protective order against Steve McCauley's four daughters now, at that point, I just, I remember thinking, that's not fair. He gets everything he wants by sticking his nose. What did he finagle to get a protective order for? It couldn't have any relevance. I don't know. But when the judge is saying, you may no longer follow, stalk, denigrate, on and on and on. It took me literally about two or three days. I did not know what that meant until I had this wait. And I contacted the district attorney, who was supposedly on my side, who had Macaulay sitting by him. And I said, is that something that just is standard? Is that a routine practice where an arresting officer who's in any way? No, there has to have been actual occurrences. The judge just does not give protective orders easily. And so I could not, I began to dig, but I was not able to turn up anything. That must, that's just something that's just like been buried. It's not like I can call the daughters on the phone to get to the bottom of that, but I did twist Jermon Hicks' um, arm enough to find out that McCulley was having problems the whole time that he, that I was in jail when he was arresting them. So at what point did they possibly begin going after his daughters? Um, I want to say when they turned their attention to him, because I think initially when Feinstein fed the story to McCulley that I was stalking myself and that he was letting me use his laptop to do it and whatnot, and he had to say that because one of my daughters had actually traced the URL address of one of the lewd emails to a location behind the Four Seasons Hotel, and that was some information early on that had been turned over to McCulley. So um, Feinstein already had a story as to when they zero in on exactly what where that coordinates might be, well, you're going to find it was my laptop because she was coming over to my home and doing all this in the evening. And Macaulay, you know, bought that. So um, I think it was around that period of time. I did speak since then to another police officer who had been involved in one of the previous crimes that Feinstein was a part of, and he said, oh, he has zero regard for authority. He threatened me at one point. So then I began to see that Macaulay's family was probably going through the same thing. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that in any way what they may have been going through reflected upon him not wanting to attend the restraining order hearing. And secondly, even prior to that, tracing, uh, chasing the jury down the hall. You know, was there some sort of threat along the line of this will happen to your children? Now, in the trial, when Macaulay was on the stand, he did admit he had found a plot on their computer to kidnap one of my daughters. Hadn't been followed through yet. Thank God I got arrested when I did. Um, and I immediately asked both girls if they had noticed anything strange. And my younger one said, oh, absolutely. Every time when I would go for a run at night in the neighborhood, this white SUV would follow me with its lights off very slow. And I would tell my dad about it. And he just said maybe it's somebody who's lost or somebody who forgot where they lived. I mean, whatever he said. But she said it happened several nights in a row. So... And it was discovered that he had a white SUV because a tenant in my building had seen someone throwing flyers out the window of a white SUV one night when I was living in North Hollywood. So that vehicle was obviously traced to Feinstein. They only got the 350 hours community service? Correct. That was it. They went back home that night. As a matter of fact, I was being interviewed on the courthouse steps by um, a news team in from the UK that ended up doing a documentary about this. And they... Um, when they were talking to me outside the courthouse and he's just been given the 20-year protective order, he walks right out. As you know, the cameras are on me and he walks right behind me and I start screaming at him. He's not even supposed to be anywhere near me. I think that was his way of saying F you to the system. I can be wherever I want, whenever I want to be, where I, want, where I am. So um, he didn't waste any time. You know, the stockings resumed even after that so-called protective order and there was just nothing more we could do about it. Eventually, I was able to get on my feet. Even with the protective order and the stalking had resumed, did you, there was no one you could go to? No there, one we could go to. No anything. recourse we had. We would have had to start all over with the prove it, prove it, prove it, prove it dialogue. What I did do, I said, I got to get this monkey off my back. I've got to do something. I began to use the media. The media had turned so 
viciously against me when I was supposedly stalking myself and ending up in jail, that they felt like they'd been duped, especially TMZ in 2020. So I made it a point to sit down with every single one and say, here's who you really should be looking at. And by the way, let me tell you all the crimes that I've since heard he's done. So they took that ball and ran with it. And it began to pop up everywhere, including in the Los Angeles Times, a more detailed article. They've really dug deep. And at the end of the LA Times article, they even said, oh, we realize he's changed his social media. He's now known as Edward Reeves. I mean, they found things I didn't even know. And so then that's when I stopped being bothered personally in my family because they've got other things to be concerned with. They don't want to be in the media for anything other than them being heroic and stopping this woman from killing someone. So, um... But I did hear from some a, a, a woman, I, uh, not that long ago, I want to say about a year ago, someone reached out to me via email saying, I live way out in a small community outside of Palmdale, and I think there's trouble in our midst. midst. We are a farming town, you know, we're on septic tanks and, and um, propane, and we have someone who's living here who's, who's causing us all trouble and taking us into court and suing us for this, that, and the other thing, and it happened to be Edward Feinstein. So I don't know why she was sharing that with me other than I did say, well, I'm not surprised, and what do you need from me, or what do you want? I speak to these women, and I say, just hold your ground. You know, I, it got really nasty with the husband of one woman, because this is, you know, God's country. This is out there in the good old land where they're all armed and dangerous, and the guy took a shotgun and went up on Feinstein's porch and put it in his face and says, you call my wife that name that you used again, and you're going to have to answer to me. So things have gotten a little testy way off the grid, far out by um, Lancaster. And then that led me to another woman who he had sued in Acton. So I don't know really how he goes from the Four Seasons Hotel, where he's used to sort of trolling this area for, for trouble, and uh, why he's way, way, way out there. Uh, but my thoughts are that he's just, he hears footsteps of everyone who he's offended along the way. And um, hopefully, for the time being, you know, that's the last I see of him. Are you at a point now where you feel like you've gotten justice? Yes. Yes, that's a good... I've never been asked that before. Y yeah, probably because I, I don't know of everybody, of anyone before who has been able to actually use the media to their advantage when everything looked so bad against them. I, I really approached them in an apologetic way. You know, you were duped and you weren't shown the full thread of what the text really was. And if you want me to show you the part where I said I was just kidding, or if you want to see the, what preceded it where Edward Feinstein said, well, you should go out and buy a gun. I mean, it's all there. Why you didn't vet him more than you did you know, isn't for me to understand. The Daily Mail had even said that my victim had less than 24 hours to live and I really bought a gun. So this story had just really grown out of proportion. And I really think that they felt, you know, they had been duped. And I didn't know that the effect of that would be him running for the hills and wanting to put as much distance between me as he could. I did get a glimpse of it, though, at, um, their sentencing hearing, when I had already been able to do a little publicity, where Pat Harris said, um, Miss DeLuise and her big mouth have destroyed my client's reputation, and they have been very afraid for their lives. Well, I can only imagine with those flyers and knowing my children were targeted. So if he's leaving me alone, that's not enough. I really just feel for these other people that are the victims as well, because it could happen to anyone, and it will. I mean, it's probably somebody right now that's being stalked by him or wonders where these strange people are coming that are delivering pizzas. What kind of toll did this take on you? Are you still dealing with this emotionally? It's been a, a while now, or have you gotten past it? I've only gotten past it in about the past year because I had to deal with two cancer surgeries. One of them was really bad. I had an ostomy bag during the time when I had when the clock was ticking to find um, an attorney. And I remember I couldn't be far from the bathroom and having to pull over on the 405 freeway running late for a meeting down in Huntington Beach because I was having these health issues and I thought, wow, this is this really sucks being me. And I did nothing wrong, but I was on a mission to clear my name. I should say that I did get a 56-figure settlement from the sheriff's department where they didn't admit to anything wrong, mind you. Um, but it helped me to get on my feet to where I could finally get out from under my ex-husband's house and um, get a used car and sort of start to put my life back together. It was too late to get my skincare business back. I gave it an attempt, but um, people had already found someone else to go to like they would if 
whoever did their highlights moved to another state and then came back. You know, you, you get happy with a new beauty purveyor, and that didn't really surprise me. But it was time for me to start looking at retiring anyway. I'd been doing it 25 years, and the end result was these two crossing my threshold. I just didn't know if it could get any worse. So um, uh, it was last June. Here we are in October. Last June, I was going for a dental appointment. I was still very sad, and I was in therapy all the time. I went for a dental appointment in um, Santa Clarita, and for some strange reason, when I left, I just had this odd feeling to go by a animal shelter. Um, I love animals, but I don't know what my inclination was. I had a cat. I stopped by. I f I'm looking at these different dogs, thinking maybe one day I'll get a dog. I had just moved into a house and had a dog door, so I have to think about a dog. And I find this really scraggly little puppy in the very, very last cell. Cell. Well, that's interesting that I'd say that, isn't it? And he had a put-down date. And um, his name is Milo. And... Um, I um I took him home with me that day. I had to stop him by dog food on the way home, and um I was like, what did I just do? Um, what am I going to do? I didn't even tell my landlord he lives in the house behind me, and here I come with the dog. Well, anyway, and I'm given a ton of paperwork from the uh, um the shelter, and when he's had his shots, when he's due for his new ones, and my life changed with that dog. He became my best friend. I had something to live for, something that required me coming home at a certain time and taking him on walks and going to the dog park. And um, I'd had him about eight months, and we had been going to a one dog park, and he was really fond of this one Doberman, and I got to know the owner. And we were all friends, and we would always go at a certain time of day. And she said to me, when's Milo's birthday? Because Sophie, my Doberman, her birthday is uh, April 26th. And I said, gosh, I don't know, but I have the paperwork at home. I guess I should look at that. And that dog was born on March 5th. That was the day I was arrested. And that was the worst day of my life and the best day of my life. So, um, you know, the faith I have and the belief in God and me, the prayers I said when I was in my jail at night got me through it all. And then this was the prize at the end. This was the thing that put my feet back on the ground and gave me a reason to really be happy and to look forward to every day no matter what it might bring and I just hug, hug him all the time and I say wow you know God gave me you there's a Blake Shelton song which reminds me of my dog every time I pet him because to see that date just jump out at me when I did not know that and yet every time March 5th would roll around I would remember where I was on March 4th the day before all this happened how happy my life was but you see, I don't go to the doctor very often, and I don't know that I would have begun to address the problems that I had in jail if I had been free. Because I learned from the doctors that the cancer I had had probably been in my body for about eight years, and it was the stress that brought it out, because it was colorectal cancer. And it was in a very strange place where it was very slowly growing. But it, is, it had expanded to where the colon lining was starting to get frayed like a garden hose with all... Um, bulge in the middle of it and they were concerned that any of the cells may have metastasized elsewhere so they took 15 lymph nodes but it had not which means by clipping out the cancer they don't use the word cure but they do say you're a survivor you don't need to come back anymore for any more testings so I tell my children thank God all that happened to me the stalking the jail the losing everything I had because I had Medi-Cal I got all those surgeries without paying for it and I might have been dead by now Right now, 2020, because of how close that cancer was to breaking through and permeating other parts of my body. So would I do all that again to live? You know, would I lose my life in order to save it? Yes, of course. It's a cautionary tale, but I'm not really sure what it tells people to be careful of. Maybe, you know, at the time when I did the Dr. Phil show, he thought it was a lesson for people not to send texts that they shouldn't send. But ultimately, I don't really think that's true, because if you were to go through everybody's phone, you're going to find something, right? I think it's more like um, you really have to stand up and, and, and look carefully at a situation before you assume what you're hearing. These men should have been vetted. They should have been looked at very carefully. And then this wouldn't have happened to me. But then if this hadn't happened to me, I may not be sitting here today. I, you know, So it is what it is, and it's, it's just something that happened to me. And I'm really, really happy that with uh, my family being where they are right now, my daughters and my, my dog, that this is the first year.
that I can't wait to see what, what else is in store for me in life. And I don't have any more concerns about those men. I don't think I'm going to have to worry about you them. You really feel like you've been able to turn it around and you're back on your feet now. This is the year. Yes. Yes. Not dependent on anyone. And it's been a whole year in my own house with my own surroundings, making an income, doing what I want to do. It took a long time. It took like five solid years to get where I felt I needed to be. But it was the redeeming of myself more than anything because I had two daughters that had looked up to me the whole time I had my skincare career. I wanted them to know the sky's the limit. And I didn't want them to be ashamed to walk around because your mother's in jail. Your mother's mugshot is all you see when you Google her name. It was I just would have stayed in that jail cell till the day I died because as long as I stayed in that jail cell, I wasn't I wasn't guilty of anything, and I went to bed at night knowing that. So, um, and by the way, one of my jurists found me later on that same year around um, Christmas. She found me on the internet and asked if she could talk to me, and I gave her my phone number. But she said to me, "Dawn, we made up our mind on day five. We were all telling the judge, when can we go home? And she says, no, you go home and the case is over, but we've already made our mind up. Well, I don't care. You get back in there. We'll tell you when it's over. And I said, well, what was the defining moment? She says, when we learned you were going to the police and they wouldn't help you. What advice would you have for somebody in your situation who is going to the police and they're not doing anything for you? I can't say. You know, well, there's this organization. I wish that there was. I wish there was some sort of watchdog organization that can go above and beyond what the police won't do with either helping to outsource those that can vet someone and find out um, what the truth of the matter is. I would just say it, it has to come down to the individual. If you know that you're right, just keep powering forward. This is the worst example ever of exposing someone who's a stalker since that time, since 2000. 14 and prior to that in 2013 when the stalking began the stalking crimes hadn't caught up with any penal codes yet if they have then that makes it a little bit easier where all you have to do is take someone's laptop and even if they were sitting in a starbucks now there's more sophisticated ways to sort of trace who who they sent what to or who owns the item i don't think that anybody's likely to end up in the situation that i was in again because everything had to fall place in place the wrong way for it to basically be what it is right now but it's only redemptive if you look at the fact that it saved my life. Dawn, thank you so much for joining us today. You're very welcome. My pleasure. If anyone out there is in need of help or is a victim of stalking, please reach out. You can find us at Strictly Stalking Pod on Instagram. If you'd like to share your story with us on Strictly Stalking, you can reach us at strictlystalkingpod at gmail.com. That's strictlystalkingpod at gmail.com. You can watch our episodes on YouTube at youtube.com slash strictlystalking. I'm Jake Deptula. And I'm Jamie Beebe. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Strictly Stalking. Mm-hmm.